Hi, I'm Joe Castellino, and this is my talk for Chat Physics Live 2021 conference. I'll be talking about why and how I stopped using formula triangles when teaching equations. So first, a little background on me. I am a secondary science teacher, and my specialism is biology. I have taught all three sciences. Um, I've taught lots of physics, actually. But more recently, I've been shifting towards a lot of biology teaching. Because of this, I would say I'm least confident in physics. And you might be thinking, well, why is she doing a talk for chat physics then? I think it's important to hear from people like me as well. We um, were underconfident, definitely. But because of that, when we teach, when I teach physics, I definitely do a lot more research, a lot more reading. I discuss with colleagues who, who know their physics really well, uh, just to make sure that my explanations are as perfect as they can possibly be. And I don't want to make any mistakes either. So coming to formula triangles then, are they bad? I won't sit here and say, yes, they are. They are horrendous. Do not use them. I have used them a lot um, earlier in my career. Uh, I'm not using them right now, but I'm not going to say I'll never use them again. So I think it depends on your context quite a lot. If you've got a class in front of you that have low working memory, they struggle to retain facts, they, um, they can't rearrange equations in maths either. If that's the case, then a formula triangle is probably going to be useful, helpful. But if you have classes like I've got quite a few, bottom set classes, who are weak in science, yes, definitely. But I know that they can actually rearrange equations if pushed. And I know that they can do it in science too then, if they can do it in maths. So it does depend on which class you are looking at and what you think about what, what they're capable of, what you know about it as well. Many students, I find, are actually capable of rearranging equations in maths. And if they can do it in maths, they can do it in science as well. I think it's important for them to see that there is a lot of maths in science too. Formula triangles can hide the maths. And this is from Why Are Formula Triangles Bad? published in Education and Chemistry. And that's really, really interesting and very important as well. Hiding the maths is quite a bad thing, I think, because students should be able to see that there is maths in science. But besides hiding the maths, formula triangles can also hide the meaning behind equations. So you might teach them the equation and what the relationships between the variables mean, and then introduce a formula triangle. This is exactly what I used to do in the past. I'd introduce the formula triangle, and then students wouldn't ever think about the meaning behind that equation again. Even if I asked them about it, they'd focus on that formula triangle. Every time they did an equation calculation, they'd think about the formula triangle. And that's not really one of my aims at all. But what is my aim then? And this is something I've been asking myself a lot recently. Is my aim to help students succeed in exams? Or is it to help them understand the content? Now, I'm not going to say that either of these answers is 100% right or 100% wrong. In some cases, the former, helping students succeed in exams, could very, very well be the right answer. So it does depend on who you're looking at. Why did I stop using formula triangles then? Now, here I, I found that the benefit of using them did not actually outweigh any of the problems, the fact that the maths was being hidden, the fact that the meaning behind equations was being hidden. And I really wanted students to apply concepts to new contexts, because that is what quite a lot of exam questions ask of our students as well. I want them to see an equation and understand it and then apply it in other places, in other parts of the course, not just that one topic or that one lesson. But it is also another thing to memorize rather than understand. A triangle itself doesn't give any meaning, but it's something for students to remember what goes at the top, what goes at the bottom, what do I do with these variables? And if they're going to memorize that, they might as well memorize the equation. All right, so I've spoken about why. Let's go on to how. So how have I stopped using formula triangles? In this case, I want to say a massive thank you to the brilliant people at CogSciSci and Chat Physics. I have been following them for quite a while and learning a lot from the people behind these groups. 
Um, and they have taught me how really to rethink everything. So I have rethought how I teach all new content. And in order to teach anything new, what I do is I write a list of questions that I want students to be able to answer at the end. I break things down to very, very small parts. And I write, write a question on it, and write the answer. And once I have that down, I then formulate my, um, my explanation. How am I going to provide these answers to these questions to my students? And I present that then. This applies to equation teaching as well. So when it comes to equations, there are two main categories, two main things I think about. One is how will I teach that relationship between variables? And two, a lot of practice with rearranging the equation. And they will have learned about rearranging equations in maths by this point, but if they haven't as well, I would have to liaise with the maths department to find out. And that is something I would definitely recommend, talking to the maths department and seeing where they are with rearranging equations and other aspects of equations as well. So here's an example of what I do now. Uh, so this is how I teach the density equation at key stage three. In the past, I've just present the equation and there you go. Whereas now I talk about each of the variables separately and then bring it together. So here I'm discussing mass and what does mass mean? So I've got two boxes with particles in it. Which one has more particles? I link that to mass and then I link back to density. I do the same process for volume as well. Go through examples of each, make sure they understand how to derive volume particularly. And then eventually I bring that equation in. So if I want to increase density, I need to increase the mass or I need to decrease the volume. And that gives me the equation of density is equal to mass divided by volume. But what I also love to do is bring in the units here because this is something I used to struggle with when I taught physics at the start. I'd, I'd forget units, not the simple ones like grams and centimeter cube, but more complicated ones. Grams per centimeter cube is not as complicated, but it is an example. And students definitely forget that. They sometimes swap them over or they can't remember how, how to write it or present it. So I think bringing in the units here as well and explaining how it's derived. So grams divided by centimeter cube is what grams per centimeter cube means. And that helps them to remember this as well. I'm explaining not just the equation and the variables, I'm also explaining the units here and how they fit in together. Here's another example. I've uh, snuck in a nice biology example here, inverse square law, but I know that this applies to physics too. So um, I think I can get away with it. So inverse square law at key stage four, and this is the relationship, in this case, the relationship between um, distance and light intensity. So I draw diagrams and I explain it. Um, I explain how the light intensity decreases as the distance increases, but what is the actual relationship? And then I bring in numbers as well to show that uh, in the form of numbers, what happens when I double the distance, so on and so forth. And then eventually I bring in the equation um, and here I bring in proportionality as well. I have made sure that my students that I teach this to know about proportionality by this point. So I can comfortably talk about it, knowing that they have heard of this before. And then we go through lots and lots of examples as well. It's very important for them to practice these equations as much as possible and answer these questions over and over again. So those were two examples of how I now teach equations without any formula triangles in sight. But what about rearranging these equations when we pr practice calculations? So for this, I tend to use the balance method um, this is a simpler method to what I was taught in my own schooling. In my own schooling, if we had a term in the numerator and we wanted to move it to the denominator, we moved it to the opposite side. And we just practiced so many questions and we just, I just know it immediately that if I move a term from one side to the other, it will move from the numerator to denominator or vice versa. This is just a simpler method. I'm sure most of you know about this already, if not all balance method. I've just taken this image from the paper I referenced earlier. And this is a chemistry equation, sorry. Uh, so this is concentration and number of moles in volume. And if I want to make volume the subject of this equation, what do I do? Well, I multiply both sides by volume. That would cancel out the volume on the one side I don't want it anymore and brings the volume to the numerator as well. 
So that's just a way of teaching rearranging. And we go through lots of examples and lots and lots of practice of doing this as well. And that's it. So there you have it. I've explained um, why I stopped using formula triangles, how I go about doing it, how I teach rearranging as well these days. Um, and so what do I do now All overall? I aim to teach the relationships between variables in an equation. I focus on that first and foremost. I list all the questions that I want students to be able to answer. What is the unit of density, for instance? And then very importantly, I ask these questions. Once I've done my explanation, I try to make sure that students know the answers and then test them on it over and over again. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that has been helpful. I would like to say a massive thank you to Fox ISI and Chat Physics, particularly Chat Physics, for giving me an opportunity today to speak. If you're interested in the two examples I mentioned, I have um, provided a better explanation, a more detailed explanation of them at my blog. Um, the link is over there. And I tweet at Dr. Castellino.